Buy this product and you will have zero trust. Zero trust network access is all you need for zero trust. Zero trust is all about identity. Micro segmentation is all you need for zero trust. Sound familiar? Like many cybersecurity concepts, zero trust has become diluted and watered down to a point where your definition of zero trust probably comes from somebody's marketing department. But is zero trust just something you buy off the shelf or is there a bit more to it? In today's video, I will take a closer look at ZTNA and reveal its dirty little secret, discuss the Palo Alto Network's approach to zero trust and conclude with three tips that will allow you to start on your zero trust journey today. Let's debunk some myths about zero trust. First and foremost, and if my intro wasn't already obvious enough, zero trust is not a product or a product category, but rather a cybersecurity strategy that aligns tightly with core business objectives. With zero trust, any digital interaction with business critical data, assets, application, or services must be continuously validated for its context. This allows us to make informed policy decisions on whether we want to allow or deny that interaction to occur. In other words, to reference the Kipling method, we must understand who is the user or device requesting the access, what is the application at layer 7, when should this access be allowed, or in other words, the schedule, where is this asset located, what is its segment, its zone, or its IP address, why should that access be allowed, is there some sort of sensitive data involved that means that user needs access, and how should that traffic be processed, or in other words, inspected. Products, of course, play a vital role in giving us this capability, but not all products are created equally in their ability to do so. For instance, let's take the product category of Zero Trust Network Access or ZTNA for an example. ZTNA is all about providing secure access to private applications, whether they be in the private data center or the public cloud. The products that fall into this ZTNA category vary widely in their ability to execute on core Zero Trust principles. And at this point, I would normally throw to a trusty old airport analogy to help explain this. But instead of that, with the help of my friend Adrian, I'm gonna show you a live demo of what a product that doesn't quite execute on zero trust network access actually looks like so you can understand the implication for yourself. So what we have here to show you today is a relatively simple setup using Kali Linux, a couple of vulnerable web servers and a vulnerable Windows 7 instance. We will be plumbing all of this together using ZTNA service, which is marketed to provide secure zero trust access to private applications. It will become apparent pretty quickly that we're able to exploit all of these vulnerable applications through the ZTNA agent with the ZTNA service being completely blind to our malicious payloads. First up, we're going to look at Atlassian Bitbucket. This is a tool used by software developers to collaborate on projects. Uh, it was also subject to a pretty high profile CVE in 2022. That allowed for remote code execution. And you can see here, we've successfully been able to exploit this particular instance of Bitbucket um, to dump the contents of the password folder. So the next test that we have here is going to involve uploading a common malware test file, which should be blocked by pretty much every anti-malware solution on the market to a, a just a, a web service that we're running here. And you can see here that in this instance, we were successfully able to upload the file the ZTNA solution apparently is protecting our network, uh, but in actual fact, there was no protections offered for either of the two tests that we just ran. Last up, we are going to hit a vulnerable version of Windows 7 with the Eternal Blue exploit. Now this is a very well-known exploit that has been widely used by threat actors in various malware campaigns because of how powerful it is at enabling lateral movement across vulnerable Windows systems. It is an exploit of the SMB process and only requires TCP 445 access to be open. In our lab, we are using a forward shell for simplicity's sake, but in a real life exploit situation, a reverse shell back to a command and control server on the internet is what we'd typically expect to see. So we've launched the exploit against our target host, as you can see. If it executes successfully, we should see a interpreter session get launched. And there we are. We've just established our beachhead that we can now leverage to gain further access into the target environment. Let's see if we can steal any administrator credentials that have been recently used to log into this host. And within a couple of seconds, we're able to successfully capture a set of administrator credentials that can be used to further escalate privileges and move laterally within this organization. 
So how can this happen? ZTNA literally has zero trust in its name. But as you just saw, Adrian was able to blast through it with ease. And this comes down to the fact that most ZTNA products are just STP or software defined perimeter in disguise. STP is nothing really new. In fact, it's been around since the early 2000s. But due to Gartner's coining of the term of ZTNA in 2019, STP vendors relabeled their products as ZTNA to jump on the zero trust hype train. But why aren't STP products able to adequately inspect network traffic? Well, to understand that, we need to go a bit deeper as to how STP products actually work. STP involves a user with a client, an access broker, and an application with an adjacent connector appliance. Connectivity from both the client on the user's machine and the connector is maintained towards the access broker in the outward direction. And if a user requires access to this application, their identity is validated first, as well as any policy requirements. And once that is validated, the access broker effectively bridges the user and application directly, allowing access. Connectivity like this is excellent as it doesn't involve you creating overly permissive firewall rules to expose your application to the public internet. And if you've ever used consumer grade IoT devices at home, such as cameras or baby cameras or doorbells, you may have wondered why you don't need to have excessive inbound firewall rules or port forwarding rules to allow yourself to access these applications from outside your home. Well, this is because they utilize the same techniques as STP, but unfortunately, the similarities between STP and consumer grade IoT devices doesn't end there. At an architectural level, STP products are not designed to do security inspection. Inspecting network traffic is hard. It takes quite a bit of compute resources to do it effectively. And if you look at both the access broker and connector, these are lightweight by design and not adequately equipped to do proper security inspection. And what this results in is an allow and ignore model where after identity is validated, any traffic inspection is often only limited to very, very basic HTTP vulnerabilities only. Applications are also only defined at layer four, or in other words, at IP address and port level. This is not only insecure, but also very, very hard and annoying to administer. And as you saw with Adrian's example, relying solely on identity is not enough, especially when you consider that the vast majority of cyber incidents involve compromised credentials in some way. And to be clear, I'm not saying STP products are inherently bad. They are certainly a lot better than allowing a VPN directly into your network. But in a zero trust world, they're simply not adequate. And coming back to our Kipling method we referenced earlier, we can see we have some gaps around the what the why and the how. So how does Palo Alto Networks do zero trust? And why should you listen to me when I've clearly drunk the Palo Alto Networks Kool-Aid? Well, here are three points to consider. If you look back at the release of the first next generation firewall, the reason it was so next gen in the first place was for its ability to provide more context into security policy. Using technologies such as user ID, application ID, and content ID, we had far more visibility into network traffic than ever before which then allows you to execute on zero trust. John Kindervag, the godfather of zero trust himself, has collaborated with Palo Alto Networks in the past and has significantly influenced our views and strategy on zero trust. And according to John, we were the only vendor that didn't think his vision for zero trust was crazy. And lastly, our network security platform is vast and all encompassing, allowing us to apply consistent security policy regardless of location. We don't need to dilute zero trust to align with our own products limitations. Prisma Access, our SSE platform, incorporates ZTNA but without the shortcomings of the SDP approach. Prisma Access leverages the same security capabilities that we're known for, but delivered as a cloud hosted service. And if we attempt the same exploits that Adrian attempted earlier, you can see that Prisma Access has no problems with blocking this. So how have we done this? Have we just taken a firewall, thrown it in the cloud and called it a cloud service? Well, that's only half true. Yes, you can consume our world leading security capability from the cloud as a cloud service, but this is a cloud native architecture designed around cloud scale, not just a monolithic firewall appliance in the cloud as our competitors might have you believe. I will cover more of Prisma Access and our broader Prisma SASE platform in future videos. When evaluating ZTNA or security products in general, it can be tempting to treat a use case or requirement in isolation. It's important to take a step back and assess how a product plays into a broader zero trust strategy, noting that the more products and the more security policy enforcement mechanisms you need to interact with, the more complex and expensive your environment will become. Be wary of products that claim to provide zero trust on their own. Zero trust is not a product, as you hopefully now know. Capability around actually delivering on a zero trust security model and the scope of the product. How many zero trust use cases can it actually cover for? 
Lastly, don't be intimidated by zero trust. Zero trust doesn't necessarily need to be end-to-end -end, and it doesn't always involve a complete technology overhaul. I highly recommend using John Kinderwag's own zero trust methodology as a starting point. It breaks the process into smaller and more manageable components and focuses on business critical assets first.